Today's episode of Hidden Forces is made possible by listeners like you. For more information about this week's episode or for easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you listen to the show on your Apple Podcast app, remember, you can give us a review. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? I'm Dimitri Kafinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, where each week I speak with experts in the fields of technology, science, finance, and culture to help you gain the tools to better navigate an increasingly complex world so that you're less surprised by tomorrow and better able to predict what happens next. My guest this week is Andre Schleifer, professor of economics at Harvard University and one of the most cited economists in the world. Schleifer has worked in the areas of comparative corporate governance, law and finance, behavioral finance, as well as institutional economics. He has published seven books, including his latest, A Crisis of Beliefs, Investor Psychology and Financial Fragility, with his co-author, Nicola Genaioli. Our conversation today centers on the subject of beliefs, how they impact markets, and how economists and financial practitioners are attempting to model them using data about people's expectations, assumptions, and attitudes in order to make better informed investment and policy decisions. The first half of the episode is devoted to exploring the mechanics of the 2007-2008 credit crisis and the role played by structured products and derivatives, off-balance sheet vehicles, money market funds, GSEs, and a policy of ultra-low interest rates that fueled overconfidence in the power of regulators and in the sustainability of the status quo. In the second half, we devote time to exploring a more formal approach to thinking about Hyman Minsky's instability hypothesis and how market participants looking at the same data day after day can suddenly draw radically different conclusions about that same data when their beliefs about the world change dramatically. Given the destabilizing forces of populist politics, trade tensions, and changing geopolitical fault lines, the ability to draw valuable insights from data about expectations and beliefs is invaluable for any investor or policymaker looking to gain a sense of market sentiment where it stands, and where it might be going. And with that, let's get right in to this week's conversation. Dr. Andre Schleifer, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. It's great having you on the program. I just finished reading your book as I was telling you. The book is called A Crisis of Beliefs. When did this come out? I think the book came out in September, maybe two months ago, just uh, for the 10th anniversary of uh, the crisis. How long were you working on it? First of all, reading the book, you realize how many citations are actually of your own papers or papers that you've co-authored with other people. I wonder how much of this book was you pulling from the body of work that you have developed over years and maybe even decades? I wouldn't say decades, but certainly many of the themes in this book go back to the things my collaborators and I have done over the last... uh, maybe one decade or five or six years. One of the reasons to write the book is that the papers we've written tended to be technical papers and they didn't deal with the financial crisis itself, the 2008 crisis. And so we wanted to write something about the crisis and all that material is totally new to the book. Mm. So the first half of the book, pretty much the first half, is an explanation of the mechanics of the crisis the mortgage market, the refinancing, securitization, CDOs, MBS, all that stuff. And the second half is an attempt to try and create some type of a framework or a model of expectations and of beliefs in order to try and see if you can extract meaningful insights about the future and about the present market conditions, right? That's correct, yes. So up until now, how useful has survey data been? How much has it been incorporated in forecasts both by the private sector as well as by the public sector and institutions like the Federal Reserve? That's a very interesting question. So 
back in the days, let's say 60 or 70 years ago, when the field of macroeconomics was developed after World War II, a lot of what macroeconomists did was to collect survey data and to predict the macroeconomy based on the survey data and the expectations of business people, executives, and so on. What happened in the 1970s to the field of uh, economics and macroeconomics in particular is that it became dominated by a very, very important idea called the rational expectations hypothesis, which is the idea that people use their understanding of the economy completely rationally and efficiently, and that once you have a model of the economy, you don't really need expectations data. The model itself will tell you what to expect. And so starting in the 1980s, the interest in survey data and expectations data and macroeconomics in particular and finance as well has waned. And I think it's only in the last several years that we're seeing a revival precisely at the same time as people realize that, well, expectations are not particularly rational, and so there may be information and survey data that we couldn't obtain otherwise. When did people begin to meaningfully question the rational expectations hypothesis? Well, again, there is uh, parallel developments, some in uh, finance and some in macroeconomics. I mean, finance, the challenges to uh, efficient markets hypothesis uh, go back to Robert Schiller's work starting in 1980, and there have been advances for the last uh, 30, 35 years. It's really a pretty developed field, a developed set of alternatives to rationality. In macroeconomics, I think, again, prior to the rational expectations revolution, there was a common way of thinking about the world, but then it declined, and it's only more recently that people started thinking about beliefs and expectations other than rational expectations in a more systematic way. Mm -hmm. Well, there's been a renewed interest in behavioral theories and finance, and in particular in economics, after the crisis. I think if I would say that finance did better than macroeconomics with respect to the crisis, I'm not sure finance was that effective in predicting the crisis. But it is certainly the case, as we try to explain in the book, that finance understood the mechanics of the crisis extremely well. And I think that probably played some role in accelerating policy right after Lehman or producing prescriptions for policy right after Lehman. Macroeconomics, I think, was far behind precisely because It didn't have a way of thinking about errors and beliefs following the financial crisis, around the financial crisis. So one of the things that it comes out from reading your book is you make it salient, the point salient, which is we know that the fractures began to emerge in financial markets and were began to become obvious in the summer of 2007, approximately with BNP Paribas, with Bear Stearns. And so there were signs that there were stresses in the market, but despite that, it was not until Lehman where you saw it both in volatility but also just in price declines where the crisis really broke out. Why don't you walk us through, because like I said, you did a great job in the beginning of the book explaining how the crisis developed over time until we got to 2008. Can you sort of take that timeline from 1996 to 2006? Yes, but let me say as a first point is that one of the things we've learned in the last decade is that financial crises all have more or less the same structure, which is their origins are always or nearly always in a bubble in the price of some particular asset or group of assets, housing being the most conspicuous example in many historical episodes that these bubbles are often financed by debt, whether it's mortgage debt in the case of the housing bubble or some other kind of debt. You know, in 1929, people used to buy stocks on margin. Margin. 
And so there is a leverage plus a bubble. And that there is also exposure of financial institutions to this bubble, either because they're the holders of debt, such as mortgages, or because they are exposed in some other way. And so what happens is that when the bubble begins to deflate or to collapse, as it did in the case of, say, U.S. stocks in 1929 or in the case of housing prices in 2008, what you see is that the holders of debt and in particular financial institutions begin losing money, begin suffering from the defaults on the debt, and that precipitates runs on banks and a financial panic. So there is a very intimate link that was understood first, actually was understood even before that, but was explained first by Charlie Kindleberger in uh, 1978 between bubbles, leverage, deflation of bubbles, and financial crisis. And so one of the things that we try to describe in the book is precisely the path of the financial crisis of 2008, which follows all the standard steps. So we had a bubble in the housing market. It started in the 90s until 1990s, U.S. home prices for close to a century were relatively steady. It reached its peak in 06, 07. The bubble was financed by debt, which was mortgage debt. That mortgage debt, through financial innovation, such as mortgage-backed securities, was converted into other kinds of debt that was held in part by institutions, but in part by banks and investment banks. So there was a lot of debt, the financial innovation associated with the housing bubble. When the bubble began to deflate in 07, a lot of the holders of debt started losing money. That included banks and investment banks, as well as financial institutions. When they started losing money, they started liquidating their positions because uh, they didn't want to run out of cash. When people liquidate their positions, the value of their holdings or the value of these assets, such as mortgage-backed securities, falls even further. And eventually, the system cracks, which is what Lehman was. It was the final run at the end of uh, a long period of degradation of the financial system. One of the things you highlight in the book is this distinction between idiosyncratic risk and systemic risk. And a lot of these uh, financial innovations and financial products were created with the idea of allowing firms to better manage their risk. But in fact, when everyone was doing them, systemic risk went up. And what you're describing there, for example, is if a system is leveraged based on the value of assets and the value of those assets begins to decline, of the liquidity begins to dry up. That's exactly right. So, again, there was a lot of sophistication to financial engineering that went into the creation of mortgage-backed securities and various other more complex derivatives such as uh, CDOs or collateralized debt obligations. And a lot of that sophistication, as you said, was an attempt to diversify risks or to put different things together into portfolios so that in normal times they wouldn't lose money or wouldn't default all at the same time. What happens at the time of stress, and that's again a financial universal, is that the things you think are uncorrelated become correlated. The things you think are different and provide you with diversification will turn out to lose value at the same time and you don't get diversification benefits. And so this particular, this growth of correlation in the time of crisis is, again, a very common feature that leads to financial panics and liquidations and crisis in the end. During the fallout, the media, of course, they picked up on regulation, they picked up on fraud, things like this. And uh, in smaller circles, there was a, an emphasis on monetary policy. There was some conversation around structured products like CDOs, but I don't know that anyone appreciated anywhere near to the extent that subsequent history would deem appropriate the impact that securitization played in facilitating leverage in the financial system. Of all the things, securitization, regulation, Fed policy, accounting standards, 
where would you rank securitization, the mortgage-backed security, collateralized debt obligations, credit default swaps, and things like this in enabling the crisis? Well, again, let me say, I want to come back to history, which is that you see financial innovation in all bubbles and crisis. You see some fraud on the margin in all bubbles and crisis. You see some bad behavior. In this instance, it was the rating agencies, but also mortgage originators in all crisis. So to me, the common features are, are bubble leverage, deflation of bubbles, and the inability of the financial system to deal with all the losses. I think if you ask how much could be attributed to financial innovation, I think it is unquestionably the case that we had more lending, more subprime lending, more bad mortgages issued than originated, and perhaps more bad behavior because of financial innovation, because of MBS and uh, CDOs. And of course, CDOs were a very important reason for the losses of the financial institutions. So I would put them fairly high, though again, I want to say that this is just part of what happens in every leveraged bubble. Mm. And of course, that goes back to something you were talking about with these fire sales. People, I don't think, certainly the public didn't understand the the role that the money markets was playing in financing a lot of these off-balance sheet entities that were carrying a lot of the risk that was not on the balance sheet of banks. Absolutely. So the money markets funds, the other were financing these uh, special investment vehicles that were holding MBS and other securities. And they were assuming that their collateral is completely safe. But then uh, when it turned out that MBS was not as safe as people thought it would be, all these institutions, all these arrangements turned out to be runnable and extremely unstable. Mm. So why is it, in your opinion, you have this great chart, you have a lot of charts in the book, many dealing with the housing market, some dealing with credit debt, but you have this one of volatility, of the VIX. And you see in the summer of 2007, we mentioned that period where volatility began to to increase, the VIX began to spike, and uh, it stayed elevated and choppy for about a year, but leading into the crisis, it began to drop. So there was this sense that uh, things were contained and then there was a marked reversal. And I think this speaks to the thesis of your book, this idea of what causes, if I understand correctly, that markets have beliefs, they have expectations, and what can cause markets to look at the same data set one day in one particular way and then have a completely different perspective the next day, and that can lead to a financial crisis. Well, that's very important again. So this crisis is characterized by this very interesting quiet period between the summer of 2007 when we see the first signs of substantial declines in home prices and losses on mortgage-backed securities and the Lehman crisis a year later. And what's interesting is that when you see the first problems in financial markets in the summer of 2007, the Fed understands them and they interpret them as liquidity problems, which is to say they want to prevent financial institutions that are suffering these losses from liquidating their positions. And so the Fed actually intervenes pretty aggressively through several programs to keep investment banks and others from liquidating their position. And these interventions work. These interventions are very successful, and so we don't have a crisis in the summer of 2007, as one might have thought. But I think, unfortunately, what happens as a result of this very successful intervention is that the Fed concludes and the policymakers conclude that what we have is not a solvency problem. What we have is not a problem whereby financial institutions are beginning to lose hundreds of billions of dollars or what ended up being hundreds of billions of dollars but rather a liquidity problem. And so they think that they have things under control. And if you look at the meetings of FOMC, 
the governing body of the Federal Reserve. If you look at the speeches of Ben Bernanke and various Fed governors, these are speeches about lack, lack of liquidity in the financial system. One of the things that you appreciate when you look through all of these charts is you can see the stress that the system came under very dramatically and the impact that government support had. For example, prime money market funds and government money market funds, the blowout in the repo market, haircuts. I mean, you could see that you said liquidity. The liquidity was drying up because it was a solvency issue, but the Fed saw it as a liquidity issue. Exactly. The issue was the solvency issue that banks were in fact projected to lose by the IMF, by the Fed as well, although the Fed has not released these projections. A tremendous amount of money, actually something that by the end of 2007 and certainly early 2008 looked like it might be threatening to the life of the financial system. But the Fed uh, pretty clearly, and you see this again in speeches, you can see this in documents, felt that things were under control, and so it did not want to step up the interventions. The pivotal moment was the rescue of Bear Stearns in March of 2008 when the Fed facilitated the acquisition of Bear Stearns by J.P. Morgan, and that was probably the pivotal moment because the question was what the authorities would do right after that. And instead of saying, never again, we now have to shore up the financial system, we have to encourage the banks to stop paying dividends, we have to encourage the banks to raise equity, we have to protect the financial system, the Fed went, and the Treasury in particular, went in exactly the opposite direction and said, well, we've saved these guys, but now you're on your own, and we're not saving anybody else. And this was the position until after Lehman. It seems to me that to the extent that the book has policy lessons, particularly with respect to 2008, it seems to me that it would have been much wiser for the Treasury and the Fed to be much more aggressive in March than they were for six months after Lehman. Of course, after Lehman, when bankrupt, policy was extremely aggressive and extremely effective, but it took Lehman Mm -hmm. to make that happen. Well, since we're talking about policy, let's actually go a little further back because every bust is preceded by a boom, and this was a huge credit boom as we've began to outline here. What role did regulators, did the central bank in particular, play in enabling this bubble? Well, that's a question that is heavily debated. The book doesn't take a particularly strong stand on this, but many people would say that the policy of low interest rates in the early 2000s was something that precipitated the boom. Of course, one has to be careful because that's probably true, but the Fed begins raising interest rates, I think, in 2003 or 2004, and that, of course, does not stop the boom. In fact, the boom speeds up considerably in 05, 06. Those are probably the most irresponsible years of the boom. I think the issue to me, again, is that the Fed does not think it's particularly in the business of monitoring risk-taking by banks. And in particular, I think it, and again, we can talk about whether or not this is something they could have done, but it's very clear that during this period, banks massively increased their exposure to the housing market through CDOs, through MBS holdings, through mortgage holdings. And the Fed continues to treat most of these holdings as completely safe investments. And, but also, you know, Greenspan is on record having stated that he wanted to create a wealth effect. There was a desire, an explicit desire to use asset price appreciation to goose the economy. I don't remember those statements. I'm sure you're right. Look, the evidence we have is that wealth effects are pretty minor, Mm -hmm. which is to say the classic example of that, of course, is that we had the internet bubble that collapsed and $5 trillion or some 
number like that of stock market wealth was lost and absolutely nothing happened mm -hmm. to the economy. The risks to the economy posed by leverage and liquidations and interruptions in the supply of credit seem to be much more significant than anything related to the wealth effect. I should say, though, now that you've raised it, that is an important issue because the wealth effect is how the Fed model operates. The Federal Reserve has a model of the U.S. economy. It doesn't particularly incorporate in any interesting way things like financial fragility and the vulnerability of financial institutions to crisis. But the wealth effect is a central feature of the Fed's macroeconomic model. So where do beliefs and expectations fit in this? Some of the things we're mentioning here are the meat and potato sort of stuff, the guts of the system. Where do the beliefs which can drive, as we say here, we went from the same conditions before Lehman to after Lehman, but markets reacted very differently. Some might say, well, that's kind of obvious because Lehman changed what people thought was possible that they didn't see before. But the question is, why didn't they see that? I think the beliefs come in three very important ways. The first one, which is in some sense the most obvious one, is that beliefs come in at the time that the housing bubble develops, which is to say that we know, and the U.S. is no exception to that. We see the same things are happening in Australia today. We see that at the time home prices are growing, people develop utterly unrealistic expectations about future continued growth of housing prices. And that is a very important feature of every bubble. The second place where beliefs enter the picture is something we already briefly discussed, which is to say that even after home prices begin falling, there is pervasive neglect of downside risk by policymakers, by market participants, and so on, which is to say that, again, we've touched on this in a number of ways. People believe in wealth effects, and Bernanke goes out and says, look, you know, subprime is a trivial part of U.S. wealth, so if you've got major subprime losses, wealth losses will be minor, and therefore the effects on the macro economy are going to be minor. People believe that banks, in fact, have a lot of capital, which they appear to have. And so that there is a lack of incorporation or lack of understanding how, through the interconnections between financial institutions, how through these fire sales mechanisms, the economy is actually much more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And the financial system is much more vulnerable. More interconnected. More interconnected than it appears to be. And of course, the reason that Lehman is such a dramatic event is precisely because that comes to light. I think one of the things that Federal Reserve officials used to say is that Lehman is like Drexel. If you may remember, Drexel was the investment bank in the 1980s merger boom. Michael Milken's investment bank at some point went under and, of course, it looked bad, but nothing happened to the macro economy, to the economy. And so many people thought that Lehman, you know, because that's not the end of the world. And that, of course, what the events surrounding Lehman bankruptcy laid bare is the enormous interconnectedness of the financial system. And fortunately, policymakers learned very fast that Lehman is not like Drexel and that it's going to bring down the whole U.S. financial system. And so then they intervene much more aggressively. That was more obvious to them in the case of AIG, but it wasn't in the case of some of these investment banks like Lehman? Because they moved very quickly to bail out AIG around the same time. When did the AIG bailout happen? The AIG bailout happened the week after Lehman. After Lehman. Again, this gets into a set of controversies that have remained unresolved. But in the two weeks leading to the Lehman bankruptcy, the authorities are watching, I think, at least four institutions. They're watching AIG, they're watching Lehman, they're watching Merrill Lynch, and they're watching Morgan Stanley. And all of them are in trouble. And I think that it so happened that Lehman came under extreme pressure mm 
first. It could have been somebody else. And so a decision was made not to rescue Lehman. And I think as soon as it became apparent, which was rather immediate, what were the consequences of Lehman bankruptcy, the authorities turned around. Barclays was in conversations to buy the bank, right? I mean, how hard was the Fed pushing for some kind of a merger or a buyout? Okay, now we are in the domain of uh, gossip, which I'm very happy to participate in. But uh, and then I'll bring I want to make I, I... sure we understand that I don't know any more than anybody else, which is that there were attempts to sell Lehman that were going on or to arrange a sale of Lehman since Bear Stearns, since right after Bear Stearns, which were not successful for whatever reasons, but I think mostly because Lehman management did not want Also, I uh, think a loan sold. from Berkshire Hathaway also was on the table, uh, or an well, equity. They, they were discussing. I think, uh, again, there were discussions. So there were several attempts to several conversations. I think the conversation that went the furthest is the conversation with Barclays Bank in the UK. I think now there are two versions of the story. There is the Hank Paulson version of the story, which is that that was supposed to happen and the British Treasury messed it all up. And so they had a plan and they just were messed up by the chancellor. I can't remember, maybe it was the governor of the Bank of England. And then there is the British version of it, which is, you know, what are you talking about? This acquisition was something we've learned about very late in the game. It would have required a huge amount of process and approval and due diligence. And the idea that we could have approved it overnight is just a a ludicrous idea. So maybe historians one day will figure out who is right about that. Of course, you know, the other side of the story is that there was literally six months of trying to sell Lehman. So why that didn't happen in advance is a a complicated story. So I took us off target. You were laying out three aspects of beliefs. One is this unhinged expectations that occur in the bull phase of the market. People expect that markets are going to continue to rise. Home prices are going to rise by 10% every month. Some of the most ridiculous estimates were in Orange County and in California in general. Orange County, I think, was 14% a year, something like that. For 10 years. For 10 10 years. This is the old trees grow to the sky. Exactly. Bubbles, and yes. that goes part and parcel with another thing you mentioned, which is the neglect of downside risk. And I think you were about to give us the third one before I took well, us off track. Well, there. the third point, which is, again, the beliefs is the question that I started on, which is why Lehman was so pivotal and why did it so radically change the situation. And I think Lehman was so pivotal. And again, this is why we call it a crisis of beliefs is precisely because it made it clear that the government essentially has to rescue everybody, which is to say that the financial system was so interdependent and the asset holdings of different financial institutions were so similar and risk exposures of different financial institutions were so similar that if one of them goes under, the others will as well. And so you have as a response to that this very massive intervention by the Fed across the board where essentially every financial institution is getting rescued. But that was when the markets turned. That That's was when the, the markets turned. Yes. Right. When they realized that they had it wrong sort of collectively. Right. And of course, again, you also see an overreaction at that time because the markets decided, and you see that, for example, in the prices of AAA-rated mortgage-backed securities, that the world's going to come to an end. But again, fortunately, the policy at that point became extremely effective, extremely aggressive. And so by March of 2008, the financial system was more or less rescued. So when you look back at expectations data from this time, what do you see? How does this correlate to what we saw in the financial markets? Well, there are several things that I can talk about. So the first one is the expectations data in the housing market and with respect to the risks of mortgage-backed securities, in fact, are totally consistent with the bubble, which is to say that people thought that home prices are going to rise much faster 
that was realistic or plausible, of course, than they actually did. And people also thought, given these beliefs about home prices, that mortgage-backed securities and even more exotic exotic instruments such as CDOs were much safer than they turned out to be. The mistakes were largely linked to the asset price appreciation asset expectations. price appreciation expectations as you say now the second place where expectations data are very helpful and the book spends a lot of time on this is this failure to appreciate the risks to the economy resulting from accumulating losses by banks and growing losses to homeowners and others related to depreciation of home prices. So if there are some tables in the book that talk about macroeconomic expectations, both of Wall Street forecasters and the Federal Reserve, and what these data show is that macroeconomic forecasters were reducing their forecasts for the growth rate of the U.S. economy, but they stayed positive through the summer of 2008, which is to say that Wall Street forecasters did not see that the financial system is about to collapse. That was one of the most stunning charts you had in the book because their meltdown scenario, I think, was was like point... Well, I'm coming to that. So, you know, one might think the Fed did better, but of course it did not, which is to say that there is a meeting on August 5th of 2008 of the FOMC, the Federal Open Markets Committee, which sets interest rate policy. And in preparation for that meeting, the staff of the Federal Reserve prepares some macroeconomic forecasts. And you saw that actually for that early August meeting, six weeks before the Lehman crisis, the Fed staff raises its forecast for the growth rate of the U.S. economy. So they obviously do not think that there is an imminent crisis. In fact, as you've pointed out, it's even more extreme than that because the Fed staff is asked to produce a forecast for the nightmare scenario, I think it had a technical term, of severe financial stress for the U.S. financial system. And the Fed uh, produces an outlook which suggests that in that case, the U.S. economy will have slight negative growth in the second half of 2008, returning to positive growth in 2009, and that the unemployment rate will peak at 6.7%. So again, there is no appreciation that something like Lehman might happen. And in reality, the unemployment rate peaked at 10%, not 6.7%. And it peaked at 10% with huge monetary and fiscal interventions. It peaked at 10% with gigantic monetary and fiscal interventions. But again, it goes to back to our point that the Fed did not then, and I don't think does today, have a correct model of the economy. And in particular, things like financial fragility and panics and crisis are not part of the Fed model. It's all about wealth effects. I want to ask you a few things, and the question that comes up with that has to do with how much of that is because of their belief that they can't model that. But did you, in this process, look at analogous forecasts during the depths of the recession in early 2009 and how those compared to estimates right before markets tanked in 08? The after Lehman, all the forecasts decline precipitously, and in fact, they probably become too negative relative to what ended up happening. But again, I don't think that people anticipated that government interventions will be as fast, as aggressive, and as effective as they turned out to be. And so you see the forecast tank after Lehman, though not before, but then recover pretty quickly. Afterwards, I should have said, by the way, that except for events like the financial crisis, you know, when the economy is going through a relatively calm period, these forecasts tend to be pretty good. It's not that they're random forecasts. They tend to be pretty good. People more or less understand how the economy works. It's precisely this neglect of risks associated with indebtedness and interconnected and net indebtedness of financial institutions that caused the forecast to be so far off. Well, I think you also mentioned this follows 
sort of appropriately is the work of Hyman Minsky because what you're citing in a sense is you're giving data that explains or that follows along Minsky's instability hypothesis, right? And that's what you see in the expectations data. Expectations are pretty much in line with financial markets except when there is a change in market regime, when there is a sudden shift in the market. That's where as you said, the Fed was actually revising their expectations up at the same time as markets began to tank. The Fed was clearly extremely late and extremely far behind in appreciating. But not just the Fed, the private sector forecasters as well in understanding the building up of risk. So do you think that it will be possible based on what you've done and what you think other researchers can do and will do, that we'll be able to get to a place where we can use survey data. So first, how good is the data? How much better can the data get? How much does it have to rely on surveys? How much can it begin to rely on big data sets produced from, uh, I don't know, search engines, social networks, et cetera, other ways of extracting data about social mood? How good can the data get? And then how good can our models get where we can actually become better at forecasting financial crises? Is that something that is realistic? So let me answer this question in three steps. The first step is that I think even without better data and better models, I think if considerations of financial fragility became closer to the forefront of macroeconomic and policy discussions, it would be a better world. For the Financial most. fragility, you're not talking about expectations data now, you're talking about systemic risk? No, I say uh, systemic risk, yes. But you know, some of what you learn from systemic risk about is the existing expectations data, which is to say that if you look and people expect 10% uh, growth in home prices or 50% growth at home prices, something is wrong. But the Fed would tell you that that's too fuzzy and not quantitative enough, or officials today would tell you that, I assume, right? Again, remember, I've tried to do it in three steps. <laughs> so the first thing is that the level, the sophistication of the conversation can be improved even with the existing data and models. So one has to go outside of the existing data or models, but it seems to me that you could have a better conversation even with the tools that we have. Second, it seems to me that, yes, absolutely, that we are at the beginning of a transition of macroeconomics to more realistic models. I think the financial crisis of 2008 shook people up, and they are much more open today. This is what you started with when you talked about behavioral macroeconomics and finance. They are much more open today than they would have been 10 years ago to the idea that we should introduce expectations and both in terms of data and in terms of models into macroeconomic analysis. So that is happening. I can't tell you how fast it will happen. And then of course the third point is that it, <laughs> it would normally take 20 years even if we do have more sophisticated macroeconomic analysis, for that to be put into the formal Fed models and for, for the data to be created. So if you think about rational expectations, the ideas came out in the 1970s and they were incorporated into the Fed model in the 1990s. Okay, so those things don't happen overnight. But we do have a lot of expectations data. They're not terrible. They're not perfect, but they're not terrible. A lot of people are beginning to collect more. So I think in that respect, things are definitely looking up. From the data that you've been looking at, because you've put a lot of work in, obviously, to do this, what do you think about where we are today? I mean, anecdotally, it seems that the markets are not responding as well to the same quality of good news today as they would have been six months ago. A case in point, perhaps, is the G20 with Trump and the Chinese. Well, I don't know exactly if anybody knows what it is that they agreed on. There is a certain amount of fuzziness about it. Look, the markets are obviously extremely nervous. Prices of risky assets are extremely high. So there is a non-trivial chance that we're going to have substantial asset price deflation, particularly of risky assets, whether we're talking about sovereign debt or whether we're talking about risky corporate debt or whether we're talking about equities. 
all these markets appear to be in uh, dangerous territory. The one thing that seems to be different in 2018, and that is thanks to policies that we introduced after the crisis, is that financial institutions appear to be financially in better shape than they were in 2007 and 2008. I think a lot of it is thanks to stress tests, which, assuming that they have the integrity we think they have, actually have played some role in shoring up the capital of the financial institutions. I think people are much more nervous about it than they were in 2007, 2008. So I think from that side, there's been a because lot of progress. Because there's memory of the crisis. There is memory of the crisis. So I think from that perspective, things are much better than they used to be. Again, you know, with the caveat that we're assuming that there is some integrity to all these regulatory mechanisms. So that's the sense in which the situation is. By the way, the situation is in some ways much more dangerous in Europe where you have in various countries populist parties that want to restructure debt and are thinking about leaving or changing the way in which the euro mechanism works and banks are in are much more vulnerable in Europe than they are in the United States. Because of the amount of sovereign debt they hold. Each other's debt they hold, yes. Right. Italian debt. Italian debt is a big one. How dangerous do you think the situation is with Italy, given the size of its bond market? And the fact that these are countries, again, that are within an exchange rate mechanism within the European Monetary Union, which is something that's very different than the United States, which uses the U.S. dollar and has been using the U.S. dollar for at least 100 years under its current incarnation. Look, again, you know, when I answer these questions, I want to distinguish the territory where I feel I know something and the territory where I think I'm making the same kind of guesses and, and conjectures as anybody else. So you have to, thinking about Italy, whether the Five Star Movement actually means what it says and uh, whether the Northern League means what it says or whether there is some kind of elaborate dance between the European community and Italy that is going to take us to the brink, but then everybody's going to walk away from the brink and make up and uh, let Italians spend a little more money and everything is going to go back to normal. I have no particular insight into that matter. It would seem to me to be totally suicidal for Italy as a country to do things that are particularly aggressive with respect to its policies. But on the other hand, you know, we're talking about extra spending of 2% of GDP, which is what they're fighting over, which seems to be a little trivial. And I can't imagine that the European authorities are going to precipitate the collapse of the European monetary system over 2% spending by Italy. So all the reasons suggest that they should agree, but you know, <laughs> sometimes reason doesn't govern. Exactly, which brings us back to rational expectations and the need to revamp our models around beliefs and guiding expectations. So before we end, I wonder... How has your research and that of your colleagues working in this field been received, first by the private sector and second by public officials and regulators? Do you see a discrepancy there? Well, let me divide those two as you've divided them. I think that I've been working on behavioral finance and ideas related to behavioral finance for many decades, and I think that those ideas have been effectively incorporated, absorbed into the thinking, into the private sector. These are not just my ideas, these are ideas of many others. And I think the private sector has very effectively absorbed behavioral finance. That doesn't mean that they've absorbed the newest stuff. It's probably going to take a little longer. But I don't think that these ideas are things that people will find particularly disagreeable. I think I found the Fed to be both the current and former officials of the Fed to be a little more defensive. I think I sort of understand it, as I said, and as I keep repeating, economic policy after Lehman was brilliant. 
And so there is a point of view that says, hey, we were brilliant after Lehman. Why do you want to pick on us about what happened uh, before Lehman? But it seems to me for thinking about the future, for thinking about the policy in the future, we actually do need to get to the bottom of what happened after Lehman. So I understand why they're irritated with uh, my trying to uh, stir this up hmm. or the book trying to stir this up because they think of themselves as saints for rescuing the free world. But it seems to me that it's nonetheless important to figure this out. So I think there are some discussions, sometimes more friendly, sometimes less friendly. But, you know, the truth is going to win out. Well, that's always hoped for. Dr. Schleifer, I want to thank you for coming on the program. It's an interesting topic. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, I don't think that the assertion that expectations and beliefs have a significant impact on markets is a controversial idea. But I think what makes this book most worth reading is that it's an attempt at modeling expectations data in a way that market participants and regulators can use in order to make better forecasts. So I highly recommend it to anyone who's interested in learning more about what's happening at the leading edge of this field. I appreciate this very much. The book has a red cover, so it's a great Christmas present. And it's got a bull on it, too. And your co-author is... Nicola Genaioli, who is a brilliant young man, uh, who was a student of mine about 15 years ago at Harvard and has been a professor of economics in Italy for the last several years. So an Italian and a Russian. Thank you very much for coming on the program. Thank you. And that was my episode with Andre Schleifer. I want to thank Andre for being on my program. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded at Edge Studio in New York City. For more information about today's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you're a regular listener to the show, take a moment to review us on Apple Podcasts. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.